We have some terrific speakers for you today, and I'm excited to introduce them. Firstly, we have Michael Ackerman, is the Chief Product and Strategy Officer at Cardlytics, where he's responsible for setting and executing on the vision of the company. Most recently, Michael was the Global Head of Pinterest Partners, where he is responsible for growing and managing ecosystems of strategic technology partners. Based in New York, but originally from Sydney, Michael is constantly exploring new insights in the intersection of marketing and technology. Paul Cochran is the Merchant Success Manager at Shopify Plus, where he partners with some of the fastest growing brands and enterprise merchants in the Asia Pacific region to help them grow bigger, faster. Jordana Silva's experience hails from the USA, where she worked for 15 years in the fashion industry. With seven years experience at Michael Kors, she has worked with leading retail partners such as Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus and Macy's. Jordana relocated to Australia four years ago, where she joined the management team of City Chic and today oversees international partners and business development. Paul Greenberg, who will be hosting our panel today, is the founder of Nora, the National Online Retail Association, and a non-executive director of the National Retail Association. He's also the chair of FIRA, Forum of International Retail Associations, run out of the US. Paul is an entrepreneur in the e-commerce and online retail space, with a broad portfolio of advisory roles in Australian global retail tech businesses. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul to lead the discussion. Thank you. Terrific. Well, thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thanks for the warm introduction and good and good morning, everyone in Australia. Good evening, everyone uh, in the US. Um, nice to be speaking. Well, uh, to set the scene, uh, um, I guess we had a bit of good news today, uh, Australia, uh, Australian Eastern Time and PST, that uh, May sales were up 17.7% in the month of May against an expected 8.5%. So there's a little bit of green shoots to kick off this morning's webinar. I'm reminded uh, of that lovely saying by Charles Dickens, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, which is from A Tale of Two Cities. And perhaps uh, with my first question going to Jordana, I'm wondering if it's not a tale of two channels, Online has boomed, but physical retail has been somewhat under pressure. So, Jordana, um, you've done an incredible job, you and the team at City Chic, uh, playing perhaps squarely in the middle. I call you a digital retailer. Can you talk through a little bit uh, from a global perspective on how your business has adapted to changing times and strategies you're using to acquire and retain customers? Sure. I mean, it's a really interesting time, um, you know, we've all been confronted with in the retail sector. And obviously, some businesses have naturally had products that um, in this changing space, people have wanted. Um, you know, I like to joke at the start of um, the pandemic, I joked with my husband that we'll be obviously eating more at home and we'll be needing more bread. And uh, I said, maybe we should get a bread maker because I, you know, wanted a new gadget. And he kind of laughed. But the funny thing is, you know, when you've I've seen some online studies and bread makers were like the number two um, product to have a rise and increase 652 percent um, in sales. So, you know, but not everybody is as lucky to have a product that became in hot demand during this time. So I think, you know, when you think about retention and acquisition, um, you know, I guess for me, what I really like to say is I think a lot of it is back to basics. Um, and the basics of e -com, and one is listening to your customer and trying to find a way to connect with your customer. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, when I say back to basics, easy tools that a lot of retailers can employ. Um, you know, when you think back to the early days of Amazon and what they did to kind of lower barriers and get customers, you know, to for the first time start shopping online, you know, they did a lot of customer first strategies. And, you know, what I've seen a lot of people do today that seems to have been really working um, are measures like um, free shipping. You know, it's interesting, but nine out of 10 shoppers cite that free shipping is the number one incentive to get them to convert. That's something that a lot of online retailers in Australia don't employ. There's thresholds. That's an easy way to connect with your customer. Yes, there's an expense involved, but at the end of the day, you do want to connect to your customer. You want to stay meaningful and you want to convert sales. Um, I've also seen another big factor, obviously, to online shopping is the ability to return easily. And what I've seen a lot of retailers doing um, is really extending those return policies. Um, even if it is only by 30 days, you know, right now there's a lot of uncertainty in general. 
Um, shoppers don't want to feel like they're locked in and that they have no ability to return. And a lot of them in Australia still use physical locations as a place to bring back returns. And even if they were comfortable, you know, returning on like, through the postal service, that still requires people to go out, go to the postal service, like the post box or post office, um, and initiate that return in person, which I think a lot of customers today might have had some anxiety or uncertainty about depending on where we were in the pandemic. So I think easy measures like that, when I say going back to basics, have really been employed. And you might think of that as a conversion tool, but at the end of the day, when you start talking to your customers through email communication, those are messages that you should be driving home. Um, so I think those are easy measures that any retailer can employ. Um, in addition to that, when you think about email communication, it is all about connecting with the customer. And obviously today, people's concerns and thoughts are different than they were probably three, four months ago. So finding that way to connect with your customer, um, I think is key. And you know, I think that can be done in a variety of ways while being authentic to your brand, but still understanding concerns that the customers have today and finding that bridge. And so I think that's just really key is, Connecting with your customers, staying authentic, and you know, employing easy measures to make the customer feel better or more secure about making an online purchase. Thank, thanks, Jordan, and it certainly seems to be working because I'm so impressed with what uh, City Chic uh, have have achieved over the last uh, or the last year or two. But certainly, the last few months, you've kept the pace up, and that's reflecting actually very nice in your share price. So, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to pop a question over to Mike, if I may, um, and uh, Mike, just to check in that you're uh, all present and correct that there's no technology hitches. Give us a no. thumbs up or a shout out. There yeah. you go. Hearing you from New York loud and clear. Wonderful. Mike, there's a lovely saying, you know, every, uh, every silver lining has a cloud. So let's uh, get a little bit down and dirty We're, with the boom in e-commerce. Um, and I know that a lot of your focus is on the banking sector, and I certainly consider bankers, retailers, like all of us. Uh, what what pain points are are, are are retailers experiencing with this explosive growth? I mean, it must be putting pressure on things like supply chain, security, you know, carbon present fraud, pay, payments, etc. Uh, could you give us a little bit of a heads up there on uh, via you know via your Codlytics lens? Uh, what some of the challenges uh, retailers are facing across the various sectors? Yeah, for sure. And and to set the stage for those that don't know, Cardlytics allows advertiser funded offers within banks native apps. So we partner with banks like Chase and Wells Fargo and Bank of America, US Bank or Lloyds and Santander in the UK and effectively help run for brands their loyalty uh, and rewards programs. So one of the biggest things and, and you, you kind of touched upon it was retailers really coming to understand what this new normal was suddenly they they have these physical stores where in the us we're still in a complete lockdown in numerous states other states are completely open um and so trying to understand where their sales are actually occurring and and where they're coming from what's interesting about the cardlytics platform is we see one in two card swipes in the continental us and so we're able to tie $3 trillion worth of consumer spending and the behavior around that back to an advertising channel. And so what that really gives us is wonderful insight into understanding what is going on right now with, with purchasing decisions for consumers, whether it be against retail or whether it be against uh, other specific verticals. So one of the most interesting things is our data was showing that COVID was already sweeping the nation long before there were any lockdowns because we already saw the change in purchase behavior. Similarly, we're also seeing the uptick, especially here in the US. Uh, we saw the coasts kind of New York and, and California kind of start imploding and going down and then the rest of the country went in the middle and now it's like ver reverberating out. And so what's really interesting is, you know, when you separate retail, like e even thinking through grocery, the price of grocery in April grew nearly 3%, which is the biggest monthly increase since the 70s. Eggs increased in the US by 16% because exactly as Jordana said, people were at home, people were, were cooking, people were, were creating bread. I made a wonderful focaccia myself. Um, and ultimately, you had all of these 
did retail shopping, but you needed to understand specifically where it was coming. You back? Um, I am sorry. Sorry about that. Um, but effectively, uh, it was just saying, you know, e-commerce was already scaling in the US. Um, yes. I think I think a bit uh, ahead of the the adoption within the within Australia, and then I think specifically with that, uh, you know, e within e-commerce you see specific verticals growing. So we saw beauty, we saw we saw groceries increase by nearly one hundred and fifty percent, and then we saw um, mechanisms like mass merchandise continue to grow. I think what was the most interesting thing for us is twofold. One, the big cities had less of a drive to online than smaller regional towns within the US. And then specifically within certain verticals that we call rise verticals, such as uh, e-commerce, uh, streaming, home delivery, food services. Obviously you saw a natural growth. What we're actually seeing right now is, is uh, uh, identifies that point to a recovery coming swift and fast. So car leases, people going and actually renting cars from Hertz and other mechanisms to be able to, to uh, go and travel across the US. And so I think like within the, the data that we see, we're seeing these wonderful shoots of green. I think what we're doing when we're partnering with, with retailers is helping them identify not just the the category but also what are the products the SKUs, the the specific dmas the distinct metro areas that are driving engagement of their products and their brands brilliant well thanks for that synopsis mike and a bit of housekeeping we're getting a few questions coming through from the audience um i'm not sure we'll be able to get through all of them but but clearly uh daniel and georgia uh those uh questions can be directed to the panelists uh at the end uh, of, of this webinar and, and they can respond individually. So keep those questions coming. If we can get through them, we will. If not, you'll get a response. And I, I'm over to you, Paul C. Lovely to see you, the, rise, the mighty Shopify, the rise and rise. What an incredible journey. And clearly embedded, uh, uh, Paul, in the, in the Shopify um, model is the power of alliances. You know, my favorite saying at the moment is, is by Carlos Slim you know, the billion out of Mexico, he says in this new wave of technologies, you can't do it all yourself. You have to form alliances. I think it's such a powerful point. And with the growth of the platform economy, uh, we've seen this clear move to strategic partnerships, your partnership with Pinterest and Facebook, for example. But Paul, what other partnerships do you see emerging uh, from this current climate? Uh, so if you can talk a little bit to that, particularly with marketplaces, retailers and uh, tech companies. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, so yeah, we recently announced partnerships with Facebook, with Facebook Shop, um, and also with uh, Walmart just recently as well. Um, so it's definitely a big sort of trend that, you know, we're seeing in, in commerce in general. And um, as a platform, you know, you make a really good point around um, it's no longer really about, it doesn't seem to be about being in silos. Um, so it seems mostly to be going towards how can, we create or how can companies create beneficial partnerships together? Um, so I work mostly in the merchant facing um, role at Shopify. Um, and so I work with a lot of merchants um, on Shopify plus and, and even there, just because merchants, their customers these days, it's not just the online store. Like it was potentially maybe even just a few years ago. Um, it's a lot about customers shopping omni, omni channel essentially. So, you know, maybe a customer wants to shop on Amazon for a certain product, but then maybe they want to go to Walmart for a different one, um, or maybe they're going to go directly uh, to the website, um, or maybe they're going to shop on Instagram. So they're shopping in lots of different ways. And so I think what it seems to be happening is as these sorts of partnerships are forming um, between, you know, companies of all different sizes to create more omnichannel um, opportunities. Um, but really at the end of the end of the day, it's all about the customer experience and making sure customers can shop wherever they want to. Um, so for us at Shopify, um, being a platform, uh, you know, we really want to allow uh, merchants to reach customers wherever their customers are. Um, so if their customers are shopping mostly through Instagram, then, you know, potentially uh, the Facebook channel is going to be their biggest driver of acquisition. 
um, and even retention. So um, I, I do see that as, as probably something that seems to be emerging out of all of this. Um, maybe that was accelerated by everything that's happened because um, maybe it's been a bit of a forcing measure for a lot of these companies. Um, potentially that would have happened four or five years down the line anyway, but now it's kind of brought the future forward a bit, um, which seems to be happening as a result of COVID. Like even if we look at other areas of commerce, um, it seems like the future has just been brought forward significantly, um, potentially like in terms of just the sheer volume of online shoppers um, as well. So I think that that's a bit of a forcing measure in terms of some of these partnerships, because there's quite a lot of opportunity in e-commerce and um, a lot of different uh, companies are seeing that opportunity and realizing that actually uh, the best way to, to realize that opportunity is to actually form partnerships. So yeah, it should be really interesting to see uh, what happens in the future in that sort of space. Oh, thanks. Next question. It's a broad one. One of our steam panel one up. Um, what the technologies do you accelerating COVID nineteen environment? Really, you know, habit and patterns of are changing. What kind of retail tech do you see playing into that? And I'll chuck it out to the floor. Whoever wants to put pick it up. I'll jump in quickly. Can you hear me just to confirm? Sure. Michael. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, it, you know, I had to give a throwback to uh, my Pinterest days. And uh, what, what we saw specifically was this focus around visual search. So being able to, to leverage not just images, you know, picture is worth a thousand words, but actually leverage visual search mechanisms within Pinterest, or now it exists within Google and other, uh, other platforms, to be able to leverage the, the image as the search tool, uh, as opposed to having to type it into your search bar and get search engine res results page. Now the image itself can be expanded. You could look at that handbag, or you can look at that and you can see the same product or similar products. It's something that we invested in very heavily at Pinterest. Uh, and it's actually where we went and did further partnerships with players like uh, Shopify to drive that inorganic growth uh, of uh, adoption of things like visual search. Excellent. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I mean, just to jump in, I think, you know, the other things that we're obviously seeing a lot of right now. Um, is huge growth against different payment solutions, right? So, um, you know, whereas a few years ago, those weren't options, um, you know, just like customers want to be shop, be able to shop on various channels, um, want to be able to use visual search, you know, want to look for some things on Instagram and other things at Walmart, um, and another thing at a department store. You know, I think in the same way, people want to have as many options as possible when it comes to payment and what works for them. And, and the flexibility obviously is what's resonating with a lot of shoppers today. And I think that's kind of been accelerated during this time of uncertainty when a lot of people have been financially hit hard. Um, the ability to have kind of a little bit more control over how you pay for goods um, seems to be key. So, you know, you can look at the, you know, the share price for Afterpay and kind of the rise of, you know, Klarna and Zip and how, you know, they're really dominating. Um, interestingly enough, um, you know, there's even companies like Wiser coming out to, um, you know, offer people who, you know, have multiple cards and maybe are experiencing some, some debt, you know, ways to even restructure, you know, their payments, their paybacks and like their loans. Um, so I think, you know, the payment solutions uh, is definitely an area that has had huge growth in the last six months. Um, and I think also, you know, looking at logistics, there's a lot of companies today with the boom of online um, that kind of brings to the forefront a lot of logistical issues um, that we take for granted. You know, as a consumer, you want to do a return, you click a little button, you put in your order number and, you know, you get a, a slip to be able to ship the goods back. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background to make that happen. And I think right now, given the rise of e-com, you know, smoothing out that back end logistics um, has created a number of solutions. Some of them have obviously been around and thought about this, you know, a few years back, um, but I think are probably great gaining more traction now, such as happy returns in the US or Returnly, um, definitely uh, companies that really ease the return process for both the retailer and the consumer. Um, and I think somebody touched on it earlier, you know, another interesting rise I've been reading some articles um, is kind of back to the subscription 
uh, models. Um, it's interesting, but I was reading somewhere about the fact that, you know, when Mother's Day came around, you can't take your mother out you know, for lunch or dinner or celebrate in the way that we've been accustomed to, right? So what happened is that gifting online really increased and that kind of ties back into that rental subscription model where even food and wine, aside from grocery stores, um, have seen a huge rise because people are at home. And so what are people doing? You know, they're signing up for subscription services to get these things delivered, whereas normally maybe they'd be thinking to go to the pub on Friday or Saturday or meet their friends out. Um, now they're bringing those things home. So I think that kind of ties into this gifting and subscription model, but I think those have also seen kind of an extra boost during this time. It's great, uh, Jordana, and, and perhaps that's also a nice reminder to me uh, to give a shout out to the team at Austray, Daniel, Georgia, people like Jess, uh, Jessica Richmond, um, the, the boom in the buy now, pay later space, which is certainly a global phenomenon. I mean, the Australians have been terrific. I uh, mentioned Afterpay, Zip, QuadPay, Splitted, Sezzle. These are all Australian companies that have created a, a nice strong footprint globally. And I think they owe a bit of a debt of thanks um, to people like Daniel, Jessica, and, and Georgia, and obviously the Austrade services. So shout out to Austrade and for this webinar. Paul, anything you'd like to add on um, on the tech technology that are accelerating? I mean, clearly, I mean, Shopify, the platform economy, uh, speaks to some incredible opportunities for merchants, both big and small, to get into the game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, two things that stand out for me is, one is around the online experience. Um, I think just because of the sheer number of uh, consumers that have come online and a lot of, a lot were the first time buyers actually that we saw at Shopify. So a lot of like new online consumers. Um, and then there was a lot of repeat purchases as well. And I think what that really sort of points to is, is just this massive influx means that consumers are probably going to have more sh online shopping experiences from different stores. And so they're probably going to have higher expectations because they just exposed to more online stores. Right. And so things like, you know, having a really easy to use website, but also things like, you know, 3d um, and augmented reality, I think is starting to become more popular um, being able to, you know, buying a piece of furniture, for example, and being able to actually render that in your own home and see how it looks as opposed to, you know, going into a, a store physically and, and having to picture it in your own home. So things like that are really going to be quite cool. Um, I saw an awesome augmented reality um, video the other day on Twitter and it was like a pair of Nike shoes and it was like, are these real or not? And it was someone going up to these pair of Nike shoes and it was so hard to tell. Um, and so at Shopify, we've kind of enabled native video and native AR um, augmented reality so that you can have 3D files and you can render them in your own home and sort of see the product. So I think that there's a big shift to making the online experience just more rich, uh, more rich overall, more like closer to that real life experience. Um, and then the other one I think is a shift towards omnichannel in terms of retail and online. So the ability to do click and collect, I think is going to move from a nice to have to a probably like a must have. Um, type product. Um, we've seen, I think in Australia at least, and, and as well in the US, like, you know, some, uh, I don't like to use the word downsizing, the, the, the term right sizing the retail footprint. So making it um, essentially not just um, a place to shop, but a place to just pick up um, or come in and experience something rather than just for shopping. So I think there's a big move towards that. Um, so we've enabled things like local pickup and curbside pickup which was quite, um, we saw a big spike in curbside pickup during peak COVID times because, um, you know, there was a safety uh, and there still is obviously, but um, so things like the ability to just shop online experience, have a really rich experience online and then be able to pick up in store if you wanted to, or have it delivered really quickly, um, I think is a big shift that we're seeing. Excellent. Well, as the saying goes, time flies when we're having fun. So I'm probably heading into the last question or two before I hand back to Georgia uh, for some closing uh, comments. Um, there have been some questions coming through, Mike. They've mostly been directed to you and, and most of them are very data and insights driven. No surprises there. I guess we live in a in a, in a in a time of of, of deep analytics um, i'm going to suggest that georgia and daniel send those over to you because there's some questions around category specific data and e right so uh, i'll hand that over to you a lot of them came from from shah uh, thanks for that shah we appreciate that and i see you've sent your details over 
So we'll make sure we respond. I guess in closing, I mean, what, you know, I suppose it's a bit of more of a future facing um, um, view. I mean, what is, you know, with the, with the change that we've seen over the last sort of three months and the acceleration of change, I mean, Rustin Kogan says that we've seen sort of five years of change in, in less than three months, you know, in terms of the push to digital. I'd like to hear from each one of you what you think uh, e-commerce uh, looks like or what retail looks like. Um, and I guess um, a question that I think came from the team at Austrade, what's one technology that you'd like to see adopted in Australia? So yes, just some closing and positioning points from uh, from this great group of panelists. Uh, maybe a start with you there, Jordana, seeing you opened. I haven't really had time to think of that one, Paul. Uh, I went first here. Um, listen, I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I think Paul touched on it just recently, but I think, you know, one thing that I think retailers need to think about, especially in the e-commerce space, is kind of creating that easy, seamless experience online. Um, and I think, you know, making sure that your UX is just super easy for the customer as we see more customers migrating online um, and whether they are a first time shopper or a repeat shopper, they are going to have higher expectations. And I think um, it's been a slower adaptation here. So I think, you know, I think a lot of retailers are going to be called to the bar to really up the ante online, make it a smooth and easy experience. And again, go back to kind of those some of those basics I touched on earlier about kind of putting the customer first. Customers have a choice of where they shop, right? And so you need to make sure that you are connecting with them, that you are um, really valuing them as customers because, you know, there's going to be other retailers here who are going to adapt to those strategies um, that make it a really rich easy um, and pleasurable experience for the customer and i think you know retailers just need to be mindful that they have to um you know that they should be wanting to step ahead um, and not follow the pack but create that unique experience first um, and some of those simple basics really resonate with customers right so i think you know really seeing what you can do to enrich that customer experience make it easy make it seamless um, and i think just putting the customer first is going to be key um, so in terms of a specific technology, um, I don't have one that comes to mind right, you know, from the top of my head, but I think it's really custom to whatever your business is, right? What is the product you're selling? What is the service you're offering? And what, you know, is going to really move the needle for your customer? Um, so I think that's kind of unique to each retailer, but I think that would be my biggest thing is that, you know, we really do need to step up the plate and put the customer first and kind of understand what the customer needs are. And Jordana, thank you. This might be a topic for another time and maybe Daniel and Georgia, the idea, especially with your time at Michael Kors, do you think a lot of brands will be going direct, you know, the growth of disintermediation? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I think the direct to customer obviously, um, you know, I think spouted out in the US a little bit earlier than it did here. But I definitely do think, um, you know, there's going to be a shift. There's a lot of uncertainty with major retailers today. Um, globally, right? You know, that is their model antiquated? Are they out of date? Um, do they even have the the cash to keep going in the way that they were? And I think, you know, with that comes opportunity for brands and retailers to independently connect more with their customer. And I think there's always been value in that. I think, you know, the nice thing is City Sheet's always been at the forefront of understanding that, you know, building that relationship 101 with your customer is key. So I definitely know that, you know, the Michael Kors team has been doing that themselves. Um, and I think a lot of US retailers have been focused on that, um, you know, over the past probably five plus years. But yeah, I think, you know, there's always going to be kind of a greater need to connect with your customer rather than relying on somebody else to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Michael and Paul C in that order, some brief closing comments before we hand back to Georgia. Yeah, so I, I, I think, you know, COVID time is like dog years. So even this 30 minute panel is like a month in, in real time. And so I think, I, I think what's interesting, though, is even when you talk about DTC, like direct to consumer, um, there's a lot of brands, Caspa, it's a mattress brand here in the US. They, while they were all online, they were all based upon Instagram, they went and then created a physical store so people could touch the mattress, they could lay down on the mattress, they could understand and have that experience. And so the the experience of online is 
the experience of in-store and the the retailers that can do that wonderfully and well and and to jordana's point put the consumer first their needs their desire to have this wonderful experience because that is what shopping is they're the ones that will be able to succeed so when i go back to australia and i i try to come back multiple times the year i always get get uh, uh kind of uh hit in the face that it's very hard to to find up-to-date product catalogs to be able to shop online to do shipping and returns there's also nowhere where i can just go and like do a guide shop to understand what my style is without the necessity to actually buy and i can think about buying it on online later and so i think again when you put the consumer at the middle and think about the experience around them the the brands that succeed in that are the ones that are ultimately going to succeed thank you michael paul yeah, I'll keep this really brief because I think I'm um, just really piggybacking off um, the the idea here that customer centric uh, is customer centricity is so important, um, and and omni channel uh, as well is just so important as well. And I think just customer expectations are going to be so much higher than they were before. And that's actually a really good opportunity for the, for the brands and the and the companies out there that are able to um, capitalize on that opportunity and deliver some like really uh, high level experiences to those consumers because that's what build, builds brand loyalty and that's what keeps them coming back for the long term as well. So I actually think there's so much opportunity um, to grow your online and also, yeah, there's still that physical presence. People still want to try the mattress. They still want to do all those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to the retail space uh, in Australia in the next sort of few years, you know, what, who are going to be those merchants that, um, you know, do meet those customer expectations and who aren't. And so it's going to be, um, I think we've just essentially the dog ears. I love that. That's a great um, way of putting it. <laughs> like pulling the future forward um, is so so correct. I think so. It's going to be very interesting times. Terrific. Well, wonderful uh, closing commentary from a terrific panel. What a great conversation, uh, Daniel Georgia. Um, uh, should I hand over to you for some votes of thanks and closings? Thank you so much, Paul, for leading the conversation today. And thank you to all of our panelists, Mike, Jordana, Paul. It's been wonderful. Um, for any companies who are overseas at the moment and considering exploring the Australian market, please reach out to Austrade. We're across North America and we'd be more than happy to jump on a call with you to help you expand into Australia. Uh, we'll be following up with an email after this. So any questions, just send back an email. Thank you so much once again. Have a good evening, day. Goodbye. <laughs> and thanks to the attendees. Goodbye, everyone.